Hi, my name is Stan, and I like to draw spaceships. In this two-part video, I'm going to talk about partially reusable launch vehicles, starting with the space shuttle. Traveling into space is expensive, very expensive. Part of that big expense is because every time we travel into space, we have to build a new rocket. Imagine if you had to build a new airliner every time you wanted to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Ideally, you'd like to recover all of the airliner and fly it again. However, if you could only reuse even part of the airliner, you'd be saving a lot of money, at least in theory, as we shall see. The most famous example of a partially reusable launcher is the Space Shuttle. The parts that get used over and over again are the orbiter and the solid rocket boosters. The part that gets tossed in the ocean after becoming a smoldering meteor is the external tank. Here's how it all works. The Space Shuttle is a marvel of engineering, a delicate balancing act of barely controlled forces. The orbiter has three main engines that run on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen stored in the external tank. This puts the center of mass, or the pivot on which you could evenly balance something, roughly here. So if we turn on the main engines, you'd have a pretty big problem, called torque, caused by the direction of the thrust, or thrust line. This problem is balanced by strapping on these solid rocket boosters, or SRBs, moving the center of thrust right under the center of mass. Pay close attention to the strange 15 degree angle of the shuttle main engines. The whole assembly lifts into the sky, turning and flipping the orbiter on its back. This is carefully orchestrated so that the shuttle's own lift doesn't throw the ascent off balance. The main engines gain power and efficiency as the air gets thinner, and the SRBs slowly lose thrust as their core burns from the inside out, widening the exhaust throat. All of this is moving that center of mass to about here. At around two minutes, the SRBs are spent and fall away. This moment of separation is where the strange engine angle reveals its purpose. The thrust line now goes through the new center of mass created by the now lighter external tank. Alright, so the space shuttle continues on its way, until it's doing the sideways really fast thing spaceships need to do to achieve orbit. The external fuel tank is spent and separates. The final nudge to orbit is carried out by the orbital maneuvering system engines. After a few busy days on orbit, the shuttle goes retrograde, or tail first, and fires those same engines again. It begins to flip back to prograde, or nose first, but stops at around 40 degrees. This is the angle of attack, or the angle at which it will hit the atmosphere. Now the orbiter gets to use its wings and aerodynamic surfaces, as it makes huge sweeping turns through the upper atmosphere during its inferno re-entry, all the way to the ground where it lands on an airstrip as an unpowered glider. The space shuttle turned out to be incredibly expensive and complicated to operate, more than canceling out all the savings of recovering the orbiter and SRBs. It remained in service for a long time because of its unique capabilities, which came in handy when building the International Space Station, but was ultimately retired when NASA decided it needed a new approach. In part two, we'll look at the difference between rockets and space planes and discuss the Falcon 9 rocket and the proposed Skylon space plane. Thanks for watching Stan Draw Spaceships.